In the last episode, the Sekigahara War begun as Uesugi Kagekatsu commenced military action against the Tokugawa clan from his position in the north. This would immediately result in the clashing of forces from both the eastern and western armies across the entire country as general hostilities erupted. Now, with Tokugawa Ieyasu having withdrawn back to Edo, he will begin his plans to retaliate against Ishida Mitsunari and his allies, a road destined to lead to a historic battle. By late summer and into the fall of the year 1600, Japan was at war with itself once again. But rather than the sporadic chaos that had gripped the country for previous decades, instead now was replaced by two opposing forces bent on annihilating each other. To the east, we see the forces loyal to the Tokugawa, who now found themselves struggling to contain the Uesugi who had initially sought to invade the Kanto region, the domain of Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now, all throughout the borders of Aitsu, Uesugi forces defended against the aggressive assaults of Tokugawa allies such as the Date and Mogami, Tokugawa loyalists of the Tohoku region who wished to halt the Uesugi advance. But the north was not the only place experiencing new violence. To the west, on the island of Kyushu, lords loyal to Ieyasu now embarked on their own crusade to crush their enemies in the western faction. Here, figures such as Kato Kiyomasa and Kuroda Yoshitaka marched against Toyotomi loyalist forces such as the Konishi, Shimazu, Kobayakawa, and Tachibana. Yoshitaka, the old lord of the Kuroda family, was actually stepping in to lead his forces, while his son, the current head of the clan, Nagamasa, hurried east to join up with Ieyasu's Grand Army. But while these outside flashpoints had erupted to the north and to the west, the most significant area of conflict was still the central region. After Tokugawa Ieyasu had fled Osaka some time earlier to move back to Edo in defense of the Uesugi threat, Ishida Mitsunari and his western army faction, who were loyal to the ruling Toyotomi regime, had swept in to seize Osaka, Kyoto, and any other Tokugawa strongholds. And as we witnessed in the past episode, things were not going smoothly for them. Particularly, we had witnessed the disastrously long siege of Fushimi Castle, where the Western Army would win a costly and time-consuming victory in seizing the fortification from the Tokugawa commander Tori Mototara. But the siege of Fushimi was not the only hardship Mitsunari would face. Seizing Osaka, home to the son and heir of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the child Hideyori, had ended up becoming more of a bane for Mitsunari than he had probably initially anticipated. The first problematic sign came in the form of his own doing. Upon seizing the castle, Mitsunari had told the man he had named as the commander-in-chief of the Western Army, Mori Teremoto, to establish himself at Osaka where he could from there coordinate the Western Army offensives. This would turn out to be a major mistake. Terimoto was the daimyo of the Mori clan, one of the most powerful and influential families in the entire nation, rivaling the Tokugawa. This had been the reason why Mitsunari had bestowed upon him such an important position within the Western Army. But now, he had told the commander-in-chief to instead sit far back away from the front and out of the spotlight for any fame or glory. But many within the Mori perceived this move as a slight by Mitsunari, an obvious attempt by him to instead take more of the recognition at the head of the Western Army faction. Whether or not this was actually true is unconfirmed, but needless to say, there were now many within the Mori who found themselves scornful towards Ishida Mitsunari, one of which was Kikawa Hiroie, who had even before the conflict began been very supportive of the Tokugawa. Now with his lord Teremoto being perhaps dishonored by Mitsunari, it was all Hiroie needed to convince Teremoto that they should send a secret message to Ieyasu. 
Tiramoto is said to have not agreed, but also did not disagree. Which was all the acceptance Hiroie needed to send word that once the grand battle was fully underway, Mori forces would not move against the Tokugawa. Mitsunari, in a single order, had unknowingly largely crippled his own army. And if we remember back, the Mori are not even supposedly the first clan to have sent word to the Tokugawa, as previously we have established the Kobayakawa had done so as well. But there was also another incident at Osaka that had gone to sour even more of Mitsunari's reputation, if that was even possible. After seizing Osaka, Mitsunari had attempted to use his increased military presence to capture a number of prominent wives and other family members of Tokugawa supporters who had been living in residences near there. With them as hostages, he would be able to call for many Tokugawa supporters to stand down, as we had seen him do during the siege of Fushimi in the previous episode. But unfortunately, during this assault to capture family members, he would cause the death of the wife of the prominent Tokugawa supporter, Hosokawa Taraoki. Taraoki's wife, the former daughter of the famous Akechi Mitsuhide, was a woman by the name of Hosokawa Gracia, Gracia being the name she had taken after converting to Christianity. Upon Mitsunari's attempts to capture her, she had ordered one of her guards to take her life so that she would not be used as a hostage. Her Christian faith had forbade her from committing suicide, but by ordering her own death, she not only deprived Mitsunari of her, but also caused a major disaster to Mitsunari's reputation. Her death would go to further splinter the already fragile alliance of the Western Army faction, as more and more lords continually viewed Mitsunari with contempt or suspicion. Her death may have also been a major contributing factor to the long siege of Tanabe. Gracia's father-in-law, the significant Lord Hosokawa Fujitaka, who had retired in favor of his son Taraoki, had largely kept himself out of the conflict. But following the death of his daughter-in-law, he immediately moved back to his castle at Tanabe in Tango province and declared his support for Ieyasu. As a result, 15,000 soldiers of the Western Army were sent to besiege him, but as it would turn out, many of them held great respect for old Fujitaka. In fact, several had even been his former students. Thus, their siege amounted to nothing as they refused to actually assault the castle. In the end, it would actually be the Emperor who would at last order Fujitaka to surrender, rather than let such a culturally significant figure as himself be killed. Either way, Fujitaka had done his part, taking 15,000 Western Army soldiers out of the entire conflict by the time the siege was over. The overall situation for Mitsunari had become much more complicated after seizing the central region. Although he now occupied the most important positions in the country, he still needed to somehow find a way to face down Ieyasu when he was to inevitably march back west. Mitsunari had lost the ability to capitalize on his initial plan of catching Ieyasu between his own forces and that of the Uesugi. Not only because the Uesugi were being contained by Tokugawa allies to the north, but also because the process of securing the central region had become, in the end, much more time consuming. The one thing that was in Mitsunari's favor was that he would likely have the ability to choose the field in which his grand battle against Ieyasu would take place. But on the other side of things, by the fall of 1600, Ieyasu had been reorganizing his forces. With his confidence placed in the hands of Date Masamune, Mogami Yoshiaki, and other northern allies who were keeping the Uesugi pinned down in Etsu, he felt comfortable leaving Edo behind once again to march back west to finally take the fight to Mitsunari. From this, he planned out his march accordingly. He and the main body of his army would proceed along the Tokaido Road back towards the west, while vanguard forces, including figures such as Fukushima Masanori, Ikeda Terumasa, and others, would be responsible for clearing the way and securing important strategic locations, like Gifu Castle, home to Oda Hidenobu, Nobunaga's grandson, who had sided with Mitsunari. But while the majority of the eastern army was set to move along the Tokaido, Ieyasu had also not forgotten about the possible threat of the Sanada clan in Shinano province. Remembering back to the previous episode, 
Sanada Masayuki, who had sons who had married into families on both sides of the conflict, had decided that he would take the side of the Western Army with his youngest son Nobushige, while his eldest son Nobuyuki was to take the side of the Tokugawa, thus ensuring that the Sanada name would survive no matter who won the war. This placed a prominent, if small, Western Army daimyo within close proximity to the Kanto region, and a direct threat to Ieyasu if he were to vacate the area, allowing the Sanada to march in. To remedy this, Ieyasu instead decided to send a contingent of his forces up along the Nakasendo Road, with which they could then deliver a token force behind to mask the Sanada's Ueda castle, pinning them in place. From there, the remainder of the army would move along the Nakasindo until they would link back up with the main Tokugawa body as they made their way into Mino province. Ieyasu would decide to entrust his son and heir, Tokugawa Hidetada, with the mission. Under his command would be other notable figures such as Honda Masanobu, Sengoku Hidehisa, and even Sanada Nobuyuki, the eldest son of Masayuki. Together it is estimated that their combined force is numbered around 38,000, while the Sanada at Ueda perhaps only had a garrison of around 3,500. By early October, Ieyasu's army at last departed from Edo and began their steady approach back westward, while his son Hidetara set out upon the Nakasendo to undertake his part of the campaign. However, just as Mitsunari had made a number of unfortunate command mistakes that would damage his army's overall strength, Ieyasu too had just made a similar lapse in judgment. It all rested with the faith he had placed in the hands of Hidetada. By the year 1600, Hidetada was around 21 years old, and although he had been born into the Sengoku period, he had yet to ever experience war. He was young and unproven, and perhaps was all too eager to impress his father by seizing Ueda and defeating the Sanada, something Ieyasu had failed to do all the way back in 1585, when he was humiliated by Sanada Masayuki, who had not only betrayed him, but skillfully defeated the Tokugawa army during the first siege of Ueda. This is something you can learn about all the way back in episode 40. However, now 15 years later, Hidetada would now try his hand at taking Ueda himself, rather than just leaving a token force to surround it. He must have been confident with the size of his army, but also the fact that among his subordinate commanders was Sanada Nobuyuki, who could be utilized not only in helping the Tokugawa forces understand the local terrain and defenses of Ueda, but also diplomatically. By the 11th of October, Hidetada's army had arrived at Ueda and established a perimeter. With their overwhelming numbers, he was quick to dispatch Nobuyuki into the castle to reason with his father and hopefully convince him to surrender. Nobuyuki is believed to have pleaded with not only his father Masayuki, but also his younger brother Nobushige, commonly known today as Yukimura. Obviously, Masayuki was never just going to give in, and thus sent Nobuyuki back to Hidetada with the message that if the Tokugawa wanted Ueda, they would have to take it by force. Yet, with the knowledge that fighting was soon to commence, the one success that Nobuyuki achieved was to arrange for the families of samurai within Ueda to be released and moved to his castle at Numata. This worked to perhaps raise the spirits of the Sanada soldiers under Nobuyuki's command, who now had less to worry about in the way of family that may be harmed inside the castle during the coming battle. Either way, with word that Masayuki was not going to give in, Hidetara readied himself for the first real action of his young life. But for those of you who don't know, Masayuki is largely considered to be one of the most bold and skilled generals of the Sengoku period. His impressive career even stretched all the way back to when he was still in direct service to none other than the legendary Takeda Shingen. To say that the young and inexperienced Hidetada never stood a chance at taking Ueda would be putting it mildly. Still, if you were just looking at the sheer numbers, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that Hidetada's 38,000 would inevitably be able to overwhelm the 3,500 Sanada defenders. In fact, this is perhaps what gave Hidetada his confidence. 
He was sure that in the end he would not only be able to take the castle, but also make it to Mino in time to link up with his father. Soon after receiving word from Nobuyuki, Hidetara ordered the assault of Ueda to commence. Masayuki and his son Nobushige took up their defensive positions and braced for the coming tide of Tokugawa soldiers. And just as before, as the enemy was funneled up towards the walls of Ueda, Sanada gunners unleashed a downpour of bullets that cut the attack to shreds. For four straight days, Hidetara sent wave after wave of troops to the castle, and time after time they were shot to pieces, while those that would have breached the walls were quickly cut down by Nobushige and the defending garrison. Finally, by the 16th of October, it had become painfully clear to Hidetara. Not only had he disastrously failed, but he was now running late to link up with his father's army. The air was filled with smoke and blood, and it was recorded at the time that the Tokugawa defeat was so bad that their number of casualties was seemingly countless. Hidetara had beat his army to a pulp, trying to seize a castle he was never supposed to take. At last, realizing it was hopeless, Hidetara broke the siege and rushed along the Nakasendo with what fraction of troops he still had to meet the rest of the Tokugawa army. However, he would never arrive in time to meet his father before the grand battle occurred. Thus, Masayuki had won yet another monumentous victory against the Tokugawa, completely repelling Hidetara and delaying him long enough so that he would never reach his father in time for the battle against Mitsunari. This was actually much more of a major victory than Masayuki might have even realized at the time. You see, with the additional troops under Hidetara's command, the Eastern Army would have swelled up to a third larger than that of the Western Army when they would inevitably meet. Without Hidetara's forces, it brought Ieyasu's numbers down to almost equal to that of the Western Army, making his own defeat much more plausible. Masayuki had done his job, and in fact perhaps did more for the Western Army than that of the Uesugi splintering the Tokugawa army and placing Mitsunari's forces in a position with near equal footing to that of their enemies. The rest was now up to Ishida Mitsunari and the Western Army High Command. Their victory was still very much achievable if they all played their part. For Ieyasu was on his way, and soon the Battle of Sekigahara was to at last begin. So, what can we learn? With the war having begun, as forces of the east and west clashed all the way from the north to the far west, Japan was deep in conflict yet again. Yet as Ieyasu had withdrawn back to Edo, Ishida Mitsunari's western army had swooped in to secure the central region, which would turn out to be a much more arduous task than perhaps initially anticipated. But while Mitsunari was facing problems of his own, Ieyasu was soon to cause trouble in his own camp as well, when he ordered his young and inexperienced son Hidetara to mask Ueda Castle while en route to the west. Hidetara instead would seek glory and recognition by laying siege to the Sanada at Ueda, where there the great samurai commander Sanada Masayuki would completely crush any attempt to seize the castle. In the end, Masayuki won yet another stunning victory against the Tokugawa, cutting down countless numbers of Tokugawa soldiers and causing Hidetara to never make it to his father in time for the Battle of Sekigahara. In the next episode, the armies of the East and West prepare for their ultimate battle, as both forces take position and clash briefly at the Kuisegawa. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.